Welcome to Motor Week. On this week's program, we're getting down and dirty with a look at 4x4s. We've got a test drive of the all-new Jeep Cherokee. Plus, Ian Royal's used car tip looks at the daddy of 4x4s, the Range Rover. All hail, thou mighty king of the road. You have ruled over all the competition for many years. Your mighty V8 throbbing under the bonnet, all 4.6 litres, magnificent. But perhaps your time has come. Or has it? Well, not if Land Rover have got anything to say about it, because although these Range Rovers may be getting a little bit long in the tooth now, with the arrival of the all-new Range Rover due almost any day, now could be the ideal time to pick up one of these as a real used car bargain. The latest shape Range Rover was launched in 1994 and was only the second generation of a car first brought out in the early 1970s. Initially, the car was seen as a real mud plugger, but then the well-heeled started to buy them. And rather than trek across a muddy field, they trek down to their favorite watering hole and pose. And so the 1980s saw the Range Rover become a real status symbol, which it remains and is likely to become even more so with the all new car. So if a used Range Rover is on your shopping list at the moment, what's the most important feature of the car to look for? Is it the chunky looks, the superb V8 engines, the alloy wheels, or the rubberized running boards? It's none of those. It's back here towards the rear of the car. This is the fuel filler. Now, remember that very closely because you'll be paying an awful lot of visits to this part of the car because with V8 engines, they're very thirsty. We're talking about 12 miles to the gallon around town, about 18 miles to the gallon on a run, if you have a gentle right foot. That means 65 pounds worth of fuel every time you fill up, 200 miles to the tank. Still fancy a Range Rover? Something rather addictive about them, isn't there? Inside, it's lavishly equipped. Leather, wood trim, superb seats, climate control, you name it, this has got it. Plus, brilliant electronic suspension, which varies the ride height. Whether blasting down the motorway or crossing a stream, this will sort it out for you. So, is there much to go wrong on these cars? Well, not an awful lot, but if you're buying any used 4x4, you need to get it checked out underneath because if this thing has been doing a lot of off-roading and perhaps it's gone down a rock-strewn river or something like that, you don't know what sort of damage might have occurred. So get it round to your local dealer, get them to put it on a ramp and get them to check thoroughly the underneath of the car. It's well worth it. On the road, the Range Rover is fine in a straight line. It's quiet, comfortable and almost serene. You really feel at ease driving this beast. But when you head off down the twisty bits, that's where you start to rock and roll because push it hard round the bend and the body just rolls and rolls and rolls. The electronic suspension tries its best, but it's not enough. So you learn to take it a bit easier. You quickly learn to just relax in this car and take life a little easier and watch the needle on the fuel gauge drop. In fact, it makes quite a good party game. If you're carrying friends in the car, you can have a bit of fun. OK, guess how much fuel we've got left now? You reckon half a tank? You're wrong, it's only a quarter of a tank. And we've only just reversed out of the driveway. Now, shifting a heavy car like this Range Rover around is not the quickest form of motoring. Nought to 60 in this 4.6 takes around nine seconds with a top speed of 120 miles an hour. And of course, it's thirsty. You could go for the 2.5 litre BMW diesel unit, but it's woefully slow, as you'll find out when the old man on his bike beats you in the getaway from the traffic lights. So the all important question is, what's it gonna cost to get a good Range Rover? Well, early 1994-95 cars are coming in at around £13,000 for a sensible mileage car, say 60000 on the clock with full history. The diesels are holding their value better. Expect to pay at least sixteen pounds for an early P-Reg 2.5. Or you could go for a car like this. It's a 4.6 HSE. It's done 51,000 miles. It's fully loaded with all the kit. When it was new, it cost £45,000. But now you could pick this car up for, wait for it, just £16,000. Yes, sixteen pounds Now, is that a big slump in value or what? But hey, as a used car buyer, do you care? Of course you don't, because you pick up the bargains. 
The Range Rover had the upper end of the 4x4 market to itself for a long time, but recently it's faced stiff competition from the Mercedes M-Class and the BMW X5, both better to drive. The new Range Rover is going to have to be good, no brilliant, to beat those chief rivals. And by the look of the photos that we've seen, it looks radically different. With a marvellous new grille and new lights and a superb interior too, it's even made it to the front page of the Detroit Motor Show News. But in the meantime, that means that cars like this are just going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and become even more of a bargain. So, what do you have to pay? Well, £16,000 for this, it cost, remember, £45,000 new. That's nearly £30,000 less. What an absolute bargain. Celebrities, royalty and the like will hanker after the new car, but for us mere mortals with more sense than money, this is the used car to buy. So there they were, the good old boys at Jeep, churning out roughy tufty no-nonsense off-roaders, just as they have done for 60 years. And then, all of a sudden, they turn around and the whole world has gone mad. All of which means Jeep needed a very, very different new Cherokee. We all know the figures, they're quoted often enough. 98% of 4x4 owners will never take their car off-road. But in the case of Jeep, it is slightly different because you're buying into a brand. If you buy a Ferrari, you're probably not going to drive everywhere at 180 miles an hour. But you want to be damn sure that you could. As with the old Cherokee, you get a choice of two different versions. Basically, you've got your City Slicker in the limited edition, and then you've got your roughy tufty good old boy in the form of the Sport. Take your pick, really. The essential differences boil down to cosmetic details, body-coloured panels here and there, but it's more to do with the ethos of the car. The limited edition feels posh, more at home on the school run. Whereas out in rural areas, you're more likely to find the sport making itself at home in the mud. Now here is something handy if you want to impress in the supermarket car park. <laughs> oh, very nifty. Right then, let's give this thing a go. OK, so Jeep would hardly send us round a course in a car that couldn't cope with it. But this thing is seriously tough. It has completed the legendary Rubicon Trail and survived that. So I guess this, to it, is nothing. To me, though, it's a challenge. They may be readjusting slightly to meet the new soft roader bias in the market, but this is still very much a proper off-roader. This will cope with things that you can't. This will cope with things that your body can't. Well, we have been warned that whatever lies over there is very tough. I've just watched the car in front. 
I don't want to do that. That doesn't look natural. And it doesn't look safe. But I'm going to be brave. <laughs> this is madness! You can't do this in a car! Why, what are you going to do to me? What happened down there? Absolutely phenomenal! That was without a doubt, that was the toughest off-roading I've ever bloody done. Yeah. You know what I think next time? I shall bring something with an outboard. Didn't know Jeep made amphibious vehicles. <laughs> I mean, in all honesty. Now, typically, Jeep aren't exactly being all mincing and coy about talking about the opposition. They're talking about Freelander. They're taking it on head to head. And if you spec'd it up to the same level of kit, this would cost less than the equivalent Freelander. Food for thought. I don't think they'll have any trouble shifting these. That's it for part one, but after the break, we see if Renault's seen it can still cut it with the best in this market. Plus, we've a drive of Mitsubishi's latest Shogun. It's getting ever tougher to be a bloke in the new millennium. I mean, just what are we supposed to be? On the one hand, kind, gentle, sensitive and caring. And on the other, we're still supposed to let a bit of the old caveman show through. It's a paradox that explains the existence of this, the combat pushchair. And if you want to find a car that mirrors this so closely it's spooky, it's that, the Renault Scenic RX4. It's got everything we need for a spot of urban off-road posturing. Big chunky wheels, extra bits of black plastic cladding and some extra ground clearance. And the same goes for the Scenic. The Renault Scenic, of course, is hardly new. It's been around since 2000 and it was the first of the mini MPVs. Since then we've seen Zafira and Multipla and all the rest. The Scenic, though, is still amongst the best and it's the only one that offers you a four-wheel drive version. From the extra ride height and the 4x4 system, it is still very much a standard scenic mechanically. We get a choice of engines in the RX4. You can have 105 brake horsepower, 1.9 litre DCI common rail diesel, or this one, which is a 2 litre, 140 brake horsepower petrol engine. It's no firecracker, but then it's not pretending to be a sports car, it's pretending to be an off roader. To drive, it does feel different from a standard Scenic, and that's for two reasons. Number one, well, I'm sitting higher up, and that's a good thing, because I do get the commanding driving position that we all like in 4x4s. 
Secondly, not quite so good. It does feel a bit heavier, a bit more clunky, a bit ponderous. You can feel the extra weight in the drivetrain, the unsprung weight, and that means it's not quite as responsive at the wheel. It's not unpleasant, and I'd say it's probably more road car-like than many a soft roader. One definite advantage of having a four-wheel drive MPV as opposed to one of the soft roaders like Freelander or whatever is inside. There's a huge amount of space, it's light and airy. You get all the advantages of a mini MPV and at the same time you get some off-road ability. More importantly, you've got that off-road image, which let's face it, is what the sector's about. You could well accuse this car of trying to be everything bar a forklift truck because it is a mini MPV, a people carrier. It's also trying to be or saying it is a bit of an off-roader and also a bit of a luxury car as well because this is the privileged Monaco version, the top spec version, which means we've got everything, everything. Leather, twin electric sunroofs, aircon, a huge list of spec, possibly even a little bit too much. Do we really need all of this? You'll pay £18,900 for the RX4 with either the diesel or the petrol engines. That's a premium of about 1500 quid over the standard Scenic. But look at it this way, compared to a soft roader with roughly comparable kit, you'll pay about £1,000 less for the RX4. It could all have gone so horribly wrong for the RX4, with the resulting car being nothing more than a jack-of-all-trades master of none. And all right, people are always going to look at you a bit oddly driving around in something like this. But it makes as much sense as many a soft roader. More than some, in fact, when you consider that what it loses in terms of pure off-road ability, it gains in family-friendly practicality. It's not an off-roader that the military will be putting orders in for, even though they do it in green. But for the rough and tumble of the school run, no worries. Now, one of the most overcrowded sections of the car market these days is that of the 4x4 market. Every car manufacturer worth their salt has got some sort of sport utility vehicle 4x4 option. But the original, and some say the best, is this, the daddy, the granddaddy of 4x4s, the Mitsubishi Shogun. Now, I know what you're thinking, engines, some engines, when you see them on car programs, you think, so what, it's an engine. But well, this one really is of note. It's the latest in a long line of fantastic Mitsubishi engines. The GDI petrol engine will have transformed it into a diesel and put it in here. So it's gone from a 2.8 to a 3.2 litre engine. It's turbocharged, intercooler, double overhead cams, etc., etc. And it's incredibly lean burning, very low CO2 emissions. And they've increased the power from 123 to 162 brake horsepower. Enough to pull this huge monster from 0 to 60 in about 11 seconds. Very impressive. But it's also versatile, as my American cousins would say. Have a look around the back. And with this car, there is maximum versatility. If getting an MPV is your idea of hell on earth, then this could be an alternative to getting one. In here is a mini seat for the kids. Have a look at this. Might take me a second, bear with me. This is, of course, a mini seat for children. So you can get two little nippers in there, or two small halves of the crankies, if you like and you've got a seat in there for the kids. And also, how about you thinking, where does Coogan keep his tool? In his toolbox. Listen to that, I sound like my dad. Since when was I impressed with toolboxes? Now, in terms of looks, this car is hardly a design classic. And I love the fact that in its 18 or 19 year history, it's only been tinkered with three times, but it still maintains that real on-road presence. And it's on-road and off-road that you have most fun in this car. So, let's go play. Now the Shogun's driving anything other than a straight line is an absolute dog, it's a howler. That's not what it's all about, but a few specifics. The suspension is a bit too rock hard actually, surprisingly for a 4x4, but I think that's got something to do with the fact that it is, unlike many other serious off-roaders, it's a monocoque design, so you don't have the cockpit sitting on this rigid cast iron basis, it's all one, and as a result you feel every corner but it means that you don't get that induced seasickness that you do get in other 4x4s. But the engine and acceleration are first class. You 
actually, for me, a general rule of thumb with 4x4s is that big is better. Size does count, and that's what the point of them is. I can't stand RAV4s. I can't for pseudo snowboarders who think they're being wacky because they've got a 4x4, but they never get it out of rear wheel drive. There's no point. Whereas with this, it's huge. It's got great off road capabilities. You can pull anything. You can get the kids in the back rear seat and a herd of sheep. Don't let them play together though, it could get messy. Now up to now you may have noticed we've made two glaring omissions. The first is the interior. Well take it from me, it's cavernous, it's grey and it's plastic, very Japanese. The second is that you haven't seen us driving off road too much. Well, take it from me, you don't need to see me going through a mud bath to know that this is one of the best, if not the best, car in its class for off-road capabilities. And it's only 28 grand. The car represents brilliant value for money. And with that new lean-burning engine, it's environmentally friendly. Hey! Well, that's all for this week, but on next week's programme, we look at the wild, mild world of family cars. See you next week.